So uh, just a couple things as we start tonight, and then I'll, I'll kind of get into our goals for tonight. Um, I hope a couple of things are beginning to happen. And it, I, just personally encouraged by the fact that um, people have kind of made a point to come up to Father John or myself, Father Pierre, Father Prentice when he's around. He, he'll be back on Saturday night. Um, saying something to the effect of, I'm beginning to get it. Like something's beginning to... Like catch me with regards to the story. So I hope that some connections are being made. Um, connected to that very much, I, I pray that um, we're really starting to see Scripture as a drama. And so what I mean by that is just like every other great drama, the way we've said this before, has um, foreshadowing. So Scripture's full of foreshadowing, right? So we began to really hit that last week, this coming week, and the next week, mo more so week eight, that's really going to be the case when we start seeing connections between Mary and Eve and Jesus and Adam. And then um, thirdly, and this might be especially for my sisters, um, I pray that we're developing a greater sense of trust in the word of God. Especially as we look at marriage, especially as we look at the dignity of man and woman, um, there's been lots of people who have tried to use the scriptures to enshrine a false understanding of the of man and woman, but to truly understand what God's revealing in Scripture um, is actually to free um, man and and especially wo a woman is what I'm thinking of right now to see that I can go to Scripture as a place to trust that's a, that it's certain that in, in other words that Scripture is not antiquated. God is never out of touch. <laughs> um, he's never irrelevant. And I'm, I'm thinking of a comment that I think it was Paul Vitz. He's a psychiatrist uh, in New York City who, who made once, and he, he said, um, a woman who knows that God is her father and Jesus is her brother is unstoppable. That's really worth thinking about. A woman who knows God is her father and Jesus as her brother is unstoppable. Why? Because so many of the challenges, we all face um, temptations in different ways and insecurities in different ways, but um, so many of those in a particular way for women just kind of melt away when you know your identity, that your identity is um, you're a daughter of the king, and it's not dependent on any external thing. It's just a reality of who you are. So I hope that's what's going on. As we begin um, tonight, maybe just mention um, three what we might call paradoxes of man, the human person. So first, this is what we've seen so far, right? Just kind of just recapping some things. So we're made in the image and likeness of God, and yet we're like the animals. There's something about the fact that we're created on the same day as the animals. And it might be worth noting that the two temptations that we struggle with are either to think that we are God or to think that we're only animals. That's the first paradox. The second one is that we're the Lord of the garden. Remember, that doesn't mean domination. That means dominion. That's why ecology is such a... I mean, care for the earth is a really significant thing. People think it's kind of like for the... whatever you want to call a certain, you know, category of folks, and you think that's not a, a church issue. Oh, yeah, it is. Church is really concerned with how we take care of creation. So we're the Lord of the garden, and yet we're made of dust. And the last paradox, I thought there was another one. Hello? And nope, there it goes. Okay, so um, we're only complete by being in relation with another. So we're only complete in being in relation with another. First the Lord, but it's not just God. It was a disturbing moment when I realized that heaven wasn't just going to be me and God. Be me, God, and you. And you probably are thinking the same thing right now if, if it's me. So tonight, here's our goals. I want to try to do um, four things. The last two rather quickly. Um, first, we want to go a little bit deeper into the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is um, 
as far as I'm concerned, this section that we want to talk about this week and next week, if we, th when I keep saying if you get this wrong, you get the story wrong. This is the part. But if you get it right, then it paves the way for all that we're talking about. Remember we, s we said again last week, you know, our agenda is very clear. Our agenda is to lead people to conversion. Because God's agenda is to lead us to surrender. That's what he wants. He wants me to be able to come to know him as he is in the goodness of his fatherhood and to hand my life back to him. So we want to continue to go deeper into the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Expose and reveal the father's heart. This, quite honestly, is the main thing I feel like I want to try to do. That's why I want to talk about John Paul and use some of his um, writings tonight a little bit. I've had this image um, the last couple of days and increasingly so tonight and then with this weekend coming up, I feel like I want to be like a lab technician and I, I want to read you an x-ray of the Father's heart. I, I just, I feel like that's what God wants to make known. Because if you, if you and I, if we get that, if we come to know who the Father is and his response to our rebellion, then everything's different. If we don't get that, then we've just learned some information. And then near the end, I want to touch really quickly on um, the good news of the gospel about marriage. And then I want to set up, there's one more thing there, but it's not there. Uh, I want to set up Sunday's um, uh, discussion on bridge out. So first, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's just, remember, we want to try to use Wednesdays to go a little bit deeper on some things that we talk about on Sunday to allow for some discussion at the table and maybe to highlight a couple of things. So just to recap a little bit, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is not a test. Um, it's not arbitrary. Knowledge of good and evil, we said this last Sunday, could perhaps be most simply understood as um, to understand or to know the origins of all reality. Remember, to eat something is to assimilate it, to, to taste it, to experience it, to break it down, to make it your own. In this case, to eat of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, means to make my own the knowledge of all reality. Excuse me, you can't do that. And again, we said last week, you can't do that not because God said you can't do that. You can't do that because you can't do that. I can't do that. I'm a creature. Only God knows the origins of all reality. So man must receive, man, humanity, right? We must receive life as a gift. This is, by the way, part of the significant reason why Jesus says, unless you become like a children or a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. A child knows it's totally dependent up to a certain age. He must receive life as a gift and not assume he is its origin. He must always remember he is dependent on God and a creature. So one of the great teachers I had in my life, Father Francis Martin, he used to say, so the, the command, right, which is, remember what we really said about the tree is what the tree is, the tree is a gift. It's a gift which enables the relation, it's a necessary gift, which enables the relationship between God and us to continue. And Father Francis Martin, he put it this way. It's as if God says, enjoy. Remember, God put man in the middle of the garden. He says, you can eat from any tree you want. You can eat anything you want, right? Most especially the tree of life. That's like the big tree, right? In other words, God's desire is for us to have life. Jesus is going to say this in John 10. I have come so that you may have life. Not just life, life abundantly, right? So God's desire is like, here, eat from the tree of life. So enjoy, experience, draw life, have authority over all that I have given you in this garden. But you shall not stretch out your hand to be as wise as me, to determine for yourself what is good and what is evil. So just continuing to kind of bore more deeply into this understanding of the tree. The command that God gives here, we, we want to make sure that we're seeing all this not in the, in the sense of a lawgiver and citizens, 
but a father and his children, or a friend and a friend. So the command is direct and personal. It's you, Tim, shall not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? And therefore, what's it call for? It calls for trust. God's inviting me into a relationship with him. So, I'll go back to that real quick. So, this is, in a certain way, we want to just keep driving this home tonight and this coming week. Sin is a rejection of a relationship. We can anticipate this weekend by saying this right now. Though we've said that the way to think of the story is creation, fall, and redemption. Fall sounds like, you know, we were just kind of wandering around and we didn't see this hole and we just fell into it, right? That is not a good depiction. It, it's more like creation, rebellion, and redemption. When you sin, when I sin, this is what God wants to help us to see. What you are doing is you are rebelling. We're going to talk about this Sunday. But think of the story of the prodigal son. Man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate that is coming to me. Or give me my share of the inheritance. How do you get an inheritance? You get an inheritance when someone dies. What is the son saying? Father, I wish you were dead. Understand when you sin, and when I sin, that's what we're saying to God. I wish you, the good Father, who gave me everything I have, I wish you were dead. That's not a fall. That's a flipping off. That's a rejection. That's a rebellion. If you want to hold on to something, ask the Spirit to just kind of let this go, let something go deeper, I would ask Him to let that go deeper into your life and pray that it will continue to go deeper into my life. That is what sin is. Until we get that, we think of sin kind of analogous to breaking the speed limit. I speed all the time. Edit that out. <laughs> never, never more than three miles over, right? That's the safe zone. I never feel bad about it. Like I don't get into the garage and make an act of contrition. <laughs> and I bet you don't either. Why? Because it's a law. Are there reasons for the law? Absolutely, right? But sin is not the breaking of a law. Sin is the rejection of a relationship. Okay. Actually, I want to go to this real quick. So in the Old Testament, life means relationship. And it especially means relationship with God. That is life. Therefore, to reject God means death. Does that make Do you get that? Everybody get that? God is life. I'm saying, I'm going to be you. I don't want you. I wish you were dead. And the response to that is, I'm now cut off from him by my choice I've willed it, and the necessary consequence, we'll talk a little bit more about this, is I die, right? I mean, if, if I unplug the lamp from the light socket, there's no electricity. I'm the lamp. He's the energy. Really lame analogy, but it helps, right? If I myself jerk the cord out of the wall, the light goes out. You and I may not experience that immediately, but it happens. So back to the command in Genesis, Genesis 2, 16, 17. So the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden. Again, most especially the tree of the knowledge or the tree of life. 
But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall die. So I told you about John Paul, so here's, um, hi, that's, that's a young me, um, and a young him, actually, uh, or younger him, and that's my uh, dear dad, that's my mom. So that was, uh, I think, right somewhere around the time I was ordained a deacon. So John Paul is, um, for lots of reasons, just one of my heroes, maybe my hero after my dad. But I want to use tonight, in a special way, um, this encyclical letter, it's about this big, in case you want to see how heavy it is. Not too bad, but it's John Paul. So if you're used to reading Francis, John Paul is not like reading Francis. Um, he's dense, and he's Polish, and he's a philosopher, and he's a poet, and enough said. So I want to use, um, no offense to any Poles, philosophers, and poets, <laughs> but I want to use um, a lot of what he says from uh, this document called The Lord and the Giver of Life. So his first three encyclicals are on the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As someone said, it's, it's as if John Paul had his whole papacy planned years before he was elected pope. It was just methodical as all get out. So this is from the encyclical letter on the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of text here, and um, I'm, I think we've got a copy of it, right? So everybody, there's, there's copies of it on the table, because I'm going to, for time, right, I'm going to fly through some of this. So try to hang with me if you can. It's paragraphs 36, 7, and 8 in um, The Lord and Giver of Life, which you can find online. All these things are um, easily accessible online. So we want to try to kind of learn from uh, one of the great heroes of the faith of recent times and what it is that he writes, because John Paul gets Genesis like few people get Genesis. So according to the witness concerning the beginning, which we find in the scriptures and in tradition after the first and also the more complete description in the book of Genesis, sin in its original form is understood as disobedience. Disobedience literally means to not hear, right? To obey means to hear from. It's become a really negative word for our culture. Um, obedience is the key to be attentive to the word of God constantly, to his voice speaking to me. So sin in its original form is understood as disobedience. It's like my nephew when he was, a, you know, he's 40 now, but when he was a little boy, he used to plug his ears, stand at the end of the driveway, yell at my mom and say, I can't hear you. <laughs> well, yeah, pull your finger out of your ear, you moron. <laughs> Lovely moron, but still. Um, <laughs> this means simply and directly transgression and a prohibition laid down by God. But in the light of the whole context, it is also obvious that the ultimate roots of this disobedience are to be sought in the whole real situation of man. So he's talking about man as a creature here. Having been called into existence. Remember one of our first goals, why is there something rather than nothing? Why are you here rather than not here? You're here, I'm here because God willed me into being. The human being, man and woman, is a creature. I don't know about you, but I, I hate that. That just annoys me. It's like when Jesus um, says, you know, at the end of the day, you are to say you are useless servants. There's a part of me, you know, in my holier side, it's like, yeah, that's who I am. There's another part of me that goes, what? I'm a, I'm a useless servant? I'm a loved, useless servant whom he calls son and who he, call, and he calls you daughter, but I'm dust. He's not. As God used to say to Catherine of Siena, I am he who is, you are she who is not. So the image of God, and here's some of those characteristics that we listed uh, a week ago. The image of God consisting in rationality, so having reason and freedom, expresses the greatness and the dignity of the human subject who is a person. But this personal subject is also always a creature. In his existence and essence, he depends on the creator. Now, you can look at that one of two ways. You can either think that that's a real pain in the neck, which is what the evil one's going to try to sow, 
or you can rest secure knowing what or who the Creator is and why it's worth being obedient and listening to Him. According to the book of Genesis, the tree the knowledge of good and evil was to express and constantly remind man of the limit impassable for a created being. Again, this isn't a limit like a law. This is, um, maybe we might call it like something like an ontological limit. It's a limit of being. Like, I can't, I can't not be a creature. It's who I am. You, you can imagine that you're something more than that, but it won't change the reality. You are a contingent, dependent being. And so am I. God's prohibition is to be understood in this sense. The Creator forbids man and woman to eat of the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. The words of the enticement, here's the evil one coming in, that is to say the temptation, as formulated in the sacred text, are an inducement to transgress this prohibition. That is to say, to go beyond the limit, to think I'm not a creature, I don't want to be a creature. I'm being held down. He's limiting me somehow. He doesn't have my best interest in mind. And then the tempter goes on to say, when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. But, but underscore this right now. That is God's intention from the beginning. That's what he wants. In fact, he wants you to be more than like God. He wants you to share in his life. That's why he made you to be divinized, right? to partake of his divine nature, to share in everything that he is by adoption, on our case, that he is by, in, uh, by nature. So the, the, the lie is just that demonic. So this is John Paul again. Huh? Disobedience means precisely going beyond that limit, which remains impassable to the will and the freedom of man as a created being. Told you John Paul's dense, right? So you go back to this and, you know, read it with a glass of wine. For God the Creator is the one definitive source of the moral order in the world created by him. Man cannot decide by himself what is good and what is evil. Cannot know good and evil like God. God knows good and evil by, without experiencing it. We only know evil by experiencing it. Right? Does that help? Maybe it doesn't. In the created world, God indeed remains the first and sovereign source for deciding about good and evil. Through him, the intimate truth of being, which is the reflection of the word, the eternal son, consubstantial with the father. To man, ooh, you're following along. To man created to the image of God, glad we copied those, the Holy Spirit gives the gift of conscience. Terribly misunderstood word right now. So that, in this conscience, the image may faithfully reflect its model, which is both wisdom and eternal law, the source of the moral order in man and in the world. Where am I? Disobedience, as the original dimension of sin, means the rejection of the source. Remember, this is the breaking of the relationship. So even though we've been talking about fall over and over again, Try to just keep hearing in your own mind, rejection. Creation, rejection, redemption. Creation, rebellion, redemption. Creation, wish you were dead. Oh, no, you don't, son. I will rescue you. To man's claim to become an independent and exclusive source for deciding about good and evil. So, musical interlude. What about conscience? Just seeing if you're paying attention. The conscience causes lots of confusions. I'm, maybe just write this down. I don't want to go through this. We don't have time. Catechism. If you don't have a catechism, please buy a catechism. Two books every Catholic should have are a Bible. Get a good one. Don't buy a cheap one. And a catechism. There's been two catechisms in the history of the church. Two universal catechisms. One in the 16th century, one just 20 some years ago. So paragraph 1776 to 1802, buy that, please. All I want to say right now is um, we, we terribly misunderstand conscience because we don't understand conscience is the place where God speaks to us. It's not just like some magic power that I have. It involves the use of reason. 
which means it has to get formed and educated. And because of the reality of evil and the culture in which we're living, it's easy to be deformed and miseducated. And so I, I, ed I form that by the word of God and by the teaching of the church. So let me just refer you to something real quick. So we, we, when we talk often about, um, don't read the slide yet or your uh, handout. Um, one of the most important things that we try to teach when we're teaching the moral life to those who are discerning coming into the Catholic Church, the moral law rests on reason. It rests on right thinking. So things, it's not like God says you can't do that. Why? Because I said so. I'm God. I can't do it. I could have said otherwise, but I said this. Uh -uh. That ain't how it works. So all that the church teaches with regards to morality doesn't, I don't want to stretch this too far, this might be too far, it doesn't really have anything to do with faith. It has to do with thinking. It means thinking rightly. Um, a massive example of that would be abortion. What is it that we're talking about? What are you doing? Well, we're, are, I mean, are we, are we emptying some cells or are we destroying a human being? How do I begin to answer that? Well, I'm going to use science. I'm going to use basic embryology. I'm going to use biology. And what does it tell me? This is a unique organism with its own DNA. It's not a clump of cells. It needs nutrients and an environment to continue to grow. Same things that you and I need. It's what you and I look like at that age of our life. That, that's either true or it's not. Okay? So we get kind of lost in, especially with the social and moral issues in our time, we get lost behind rhetoric, yelling, what we want to do is we, we just want, we want people to think. So the church would teach, using reason, that there's, there's a simple either or. Either, because science tells me, right? Embryology tells me that that's a human being. You can't deny that. What you can deny is it's a person. And that's what they deny, those who are in favor of abortion. So you have a simple either or. Either all human beings are persons and therefore have rights, the most important which is the right to life without which there are no other rights, or only some human beings are persons and therefore have rights. If it's only some, who gets the power to make that decision? And what would they use as the criteria? Ethnicity? Skin color? Age? Health? Wealth? It would have to be an arbitrary decision. That's the either or. Which culture would you rather live in? One where all human beings are treated as persons and therefore have rights? Or one where only some are? Wouldn't you rather live in a culture where all human beings are treated as persons? That's a simple argument. I didn't quote the catechism. I didn't open up to the gospels. We just want to think but we don't think very often anymore. One of the most amazing examples of our grasping at God is in the 1992 Supreme Court case, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. In the middle of this decision, here's a quote from our Supreme Court. 
at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Anybody familiar with the word hubris? That's hubris. At the heart of my own personal liberty is the right to define the meaning of the universe. You've got to be kidding. What are you talking about? And what happens when my meaning of the universe clashes with your meaning of the universe? Well, we go to a court and we make an argument, which is what we do. There's no truth. There's just power. And power gets to make decisions based on majority, strength, military, money, whatever, right? You get that? This is um, in a, an incredibly egregious example of what it is that God is forbidding us to do. And it, and it brings disastrous results. Just look around. Back to John Paul. According to the witness of the beginning, God in creation has revealed himself. So here we're going to kind of slowly, I want us to try to shift into like getting a glimpse of the Father's heart here. And to see what begins to, this is beginning to help us get ready for this weekend. God has revealed himself as omnipotence, but not sheer power, right? God is love. At the same time, he has revealed to man that as the image and likeness of his creator, he is called to participate. It's a relational word again, huh? In truth and love. This participation means a life in union with God, who is eternal life. But man, under the influence of the father of lies, has separated himself from this participation. Here's where I think John Paul's insights are um, astounding in these next couple of slides. Man's disobedience always means a... Ch so here, we're trying to go deeper into what sin is, right? What is it to eat of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil? It's a turning away from God. I wish you were dead. I wish you were out of my life. In a certain sense, the closing up of human freedom in this regard. But that's not it. There's another part. So I'm turning away from him. I'm closing myself to him, and what am I doing? I'm turning towards someone else, and I'm opening myself up towards someone else. Hear this, please, like with as much energy as I can muster. There are two and only two kingdoms. There is the kingdom of God and light, and there is the kingdom of the enemy and of darkness, and you're either in one or the other. And if you're a parent, as a deacon put it recently at uh, a seminar on Sacred Heart, and you've got children at home, please hear this. You are either bringing your child to Jesus finish the sentence or you are bringing him or her to someone else. There is no neutrality here. That's the starkness of reality. You may not like it that way. I don't like it that way either, actually. But that's the starkness of reality. That's why conversion is crucial. I'm either walking towards the Lord or I'm walking away from him. Or as Father Francis Martin had put in again, you know, like the Christian life's like trying to walk up a down escalator. What happens when you stop walking? You go down, all right? You're never standing still. The, fr the, the sheer weight of the burden, if you will, of having, a f having been made free is found right here. Like my choices matter. They have eternal consequences. I prayed with a guy last night who was in a coma, who died this afternoon. I know nothing about this man's life. All I know is the moment I put my hand on him to pray with him, he was in a coma. It was as if I saw him sit up 
and he just grabbed me and he said, help me. Because our consequence, or our choices have consequences. They're so much more important than we think. So I'm opening myself up now the opening of my freedom, that means my mind and my will, to the one who is the father of lies. This act of conscious choice is not only disobedience, but also involves a certain consent to the motivation which was contained in the first temptation to sin and which is unceasingly renewed during the whole history of man on earth. Here's the lie, right? God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here we find ourselves, and here's the brilliance of John Paul, at the very center of what could be called the anti-word. That is to say, the anti-truth. For the truth about man becomes falsified. Who man is and what are the impassable limits of his being and freedom. This anti-truth is possible because at the same time, there is a complete falsification of the truth about who God is. And this is, we're going to talk, this is this weekend. This is what the enemy does. God the creator is placed in a state of suspicion. Indeed of accusation in the mind of the creature. We put God on trial. C.S. Lewis used to call it putting God in the dock. It's an English expression for going to court. For the first time in human history, there appears the perverse Genius of suspicion. He speaks to falsify good itself, the absolute good, which is not like unknown to the first man and woman, right? Like they're living in paradise. The absolute good, which precisely in the work of creation has manifested itself as the good which gives in an inexpressible way, the good which is diffusive of itself, in case you don't know Latin. Hello. In spite of all the witness of creation, and of the salvific economy inherent in it. Begin to get a glimpse right now in who the opponent is. So Adam and Eve, or man and woman, they don't have a name yet other than man and woman. They know nothing but perfection. Nothing's ever died. Nothing's ever broken. They've never been used by the other. They've never been threatened. They're in harmony with the animals. Everything is as it was created to be. They know nothing but good. But the spirit of darkness, for them who know nothing but good, is capable of showing God as an enemy of his own creature. And in the first place, as an enemy of man, as a source of danger and threat to him. In this way, Satan manages to sow in man's soul the seed of opposition to the one who from the beginning would be considered as man's enemy and not his father. Man is challenged to become the adversary of God. So just think of this. If he is able to do that with those whom he has made who know nothing but goodness... what will he be able to do with you and me? If he can get them to doubt God as being good, how many of us have, I mean, just think of the, the day for some of us, right? Prayers that weren't answered. Things that didn't go the way we wanted. Death, sickness, and all the while, there's that voice, see? He's not your father. He's your adversary. John Paul continues. The analysis of sin in its original dimension indicates that through the influence of the father of lies throughout the history of humanity, there will be a constant pressure on him to reject God even to the point of hating him. 
So St. Augustine defines sin as the love of self to the point of contempt for God. Man will be inclined to see in God primarily a limitation of himself. Why do we want to remove the Ten Commandments? They're limits, restrictions, and not the source of his freedom and the fullness of good. Wrapping up here. So I'll skip this. Let me, um, we're going to go, I want to, um, if you get home, flip to um, paragraph 39 in this document. Because what John Paul says in this paragraph is this. So sin is rejection and rebellion, right? So the good father cast is the enemy. Man says, I wish you were dead. God's response? Here's how John Paul puts it. The concept of God as the necessarily most perfect being certainly excludes from God any pain deriving from deficiencies or wounds, but in the depths of God, there is a father's love that faced with man's sin, that is to say his rejection and rebellion, that in the language of the Bible he reacts so deeply as to say, I am sorry that I have made him. That's not anger. That's sadness. That's the x-ray of the father's heart. We're always talking, you know, in quotes when we say things like this. God becomes sad. He feels pain. But there is, the scriptures reveal this to us, right? God's response to my rejection is my son whom I love has gone. And his sadness is because in going, you will die. And I didn't make you to die. Do you get that? Until we get that, this is repentance doesn't make sense. When you get that, then what you want to do is turn around and run home. Because the Father of mercies is always waiting to take us home. Always. But until we get that, we're just talking about rules. And God doesn't make rules. That's not who he is. All right. Um, you're not even going to get the good news about marriage. Sorry, it's too late. Here's the good news about marriage. How God created us to live at the beginning, we can still live. Period. That's it. That's the good news about marriage. So, which is to say that, yes, the falls happened, by all means. Yeah, you and I now live with concupiscence, which means the inclination to be selfish. Yes, we now have this, you know, millennia of... Um, history of relationships between men and women where we've used, exploited, connived in being used, lusted after, wanted to be lusted after, whatever, right? That's the history of our relationship, fine, albeit. This changed everything. This means grace has now entered into the world and in Matthew 19, Jesus says, when he's asked the question about divorce, he points back to the original time when God made man and woman and in doing so, John Paul says, he's telling us, Though that time is gone historically by grace, that is to say by power, the power that flows from his resurrection, you can live that way. You can overcome it. Not because you're strong, you're not. Not because I'm strong, I'm not. But because he's strong and he's in me. This is where an understanding of the sacraments, in an especial way the understanding of the sacrament of marriage becomes huge. In other words, I can be great and you can be great. I can love, I can forgive, I can be merciful, I can be patient. I have no excuse not to do it. I just don't want to do it when I don't do it. But grace is there. That's the good news about God, of, of the gospel about marriage. God's original plan, Jesus says, is still accessible to you and me today. 
The scriptural understanding of marriage is not an ideal. Any more than the scriptural understanding of priesthood is an ideal. I can live it. You can live it. Okay? Let's end with this. Just, uh, I'm thinking in anticipation a little bit of uh, um, this coming week. So the end of Genesis 2 prepares for the beginning of Genesis 3. I just want to encourage us in these days ahead just to pray with chapter 3 and let the Lord speech speak to us. So Genesis 2.25 is the man and the woman, or the man and his wife, were both naked and were not ashamed. The word naked in Hebrew is arumim. That's significant because um, the next sentence begins, Now the serpent was more subtle than any creature God had made. And the word for subtle is arum. So arumim and arum. It's a play on words. The one is preparing you for the next. The serpent is, in a particular way, a remarkably, um, we might say, apt, appropriate image of temptation. They look slow. They make no noise. They're small. They appear harmless, benign, innocuous. You can't see them. They blend with the ground. The moment you see it, it has you. And though it appears benign and innocuous, it kills always, in this case. And that's a perfect image for temptation. Because the wages of sin is death. Which is why John Paul, in another place, simply said, have nothing at all to do with the dragon, or the serpent, or the snake. Don't flirt with them. Don't play with them. Don't think he's cute. He's not a pet. And we'll talk much more about him next week. Okay? So as always, there's uh, some of the questions that we've got. Um, I might just kind of record afterwards. That's what we're trying to do is John posts questions that we don't get to. And then um, uh, we put them on the rerouting website. So I still got some from last week. We're running a little behind. Father Prentice was on retreat last week. He's um, down in Mexico City this week um, on pilgrimage to Our Lady of Guadalupe. He's praying for us there to, uh, this week, today. So I'm kind of shorthanded. So give me... Um, I beg your patience because we get to um, the questions. Plus, you know, quite honestly, like some of the questions aren't the kind of questions that you just want to like, oh, I think it means this. Um, so, um, like, I'm not that smart, so we're going to go look up some of these things. There's a couple questions having to do with, um, in one way or another, if God's creation was all good, wasn't the serpent good at one time? This is the focus this week, so if you've if you've been coming to rerouting, you should, you should, I don't want to say this like, you know, harshly, but you should know the answer to that question now. God created everything. Everything he made was good. One of the things we looked at in Genesis 1, it's verse 24, um, on the sixth day, it, that includes the thing, you know, so he made the cattle and the birds of the air and the creeping things that crawl on the ground. What creeps on the ground? Snakes, right? So, and we're going to see this week in... Um, uh, Genesis 3, that first verse that we looked at a minute ago as we wrapped up uh, the session, the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. So what's Scripture doing? Scripture is revealing to us that nothing's outside of God's control. So we're going to get into all this this weekend, so we'll save that. But for right now, just a lot of us have, you know, like almost from, you know, like movies of... 
every great story has something to do with the story of the gospel. Like, it, there's a trace of it in there. It's the best story. And so everybody's always trying to find a way to retell it, absent God, you know? And so we often see in these kind of superhero movies or whatever, or comic book stories, it's like good God, bad God. And that kind of permeates our thinking oftentimes. There's these two contrasting, fighting beings, a good force and a bad force. Um, that's not scripture. Uh -uh. There's one God, and he made everything. He has no rivals. He has no threats. Um, we pray the prayer of St. Michael the Archangel because the devil's rival, if you will, is Michael, another creature. So we're going we're to talk about that this week. So if you can hold on to that, I think you'll find it's answered. But um, everything that God made, or everything that is God made. Um, similarly, was the snake, you know, a metaphor... So, um, again, if we're paying attention and we've been coming on Sundays, we should be able to answer that for each other. Genesis is best understood. It's a genre, right? It's inspired poetry. A lot of us don't like that because um, you weren't an LSNA major. <laughs> so I had a liberal arts degree. Do you know what the alternative to a liberal arts degree is? A servile degree. That's the classical alternative. There are liberal arts and there are servile arts. What are liberal arts? Liberal arts are things which are ends in themselves. Why do you paint? For painting. Why do you write music? To write music. Why do you write poetry? To create poetry. So there are things which are ends in themselves. Like, that's what play is. That's what leisure is. That's why everybody hated us who were in LSNA. <laughs> right? What are you going to do with that? That's a servile art. It's something which is a means to an end. That's not to say one's, um, like those of you who went to engineering school or something like that, it's not, a, it's not to be pejorative. It's just to help us understand, like, Liberal arts are things which are ends in themselves. And part of our challenge right now as a culture is we don't know how to enjoy leisure. We're constantly going, what am I going to do with that? What am I going to do with that? How am I going to use that? But that's not how we're supposed to live. You're supposed to enjoy life. That's part of the Sabbath commandment, God's commandment. Rest, play, relax. What does that become for some of us? Watch a game. That's not relaxing. <laughs> not if you're me. I can't even watch it. That's how bad it is. Unless they win. Which means I don't watch it. I tape it. Watch it, win. Lose, don't watch it. Or win, I watch it. I mean, it's, that's not leisure. It's the antithesis of leisure. Like it just brings, you know, indigestion. It's horrible. It's not good. But so we've reduced... Athletics or sports, that's our leisure. Mm -mm. Leisure is things. So think of leisure as leisure is the things you want to do when you don't have to do anything else. When I got nothing left to do, what do I want to do? And scary for many of us, we don't know. Because we've never allowed ourselves to get there. But that's how we're supposed to live. So poetry is one of those ways to speak about truth in a way that's much more profound than math or science because it speaks to the whole person, not just to the mathematical part of my intellect. It involves the imagination. Does that make, do you get this or no? Some of you? So, the serpent is, um, this is poetry. That man, you know, there's not a tree, there's not a fruit, it's not an apple, there's not a snake. I know we have to keep saying that, but we're not getting this. That's why if you get this wrong, 
and you get to a point where you think, but I'm an educated person, and I'm supposed to believe this? This is stupid. No, we're just not understanding how it's speaking to us. The scriptures, if you can go back to Father Prentice and uh, Father John's discussion before um, Mass, not this weekend, this past weekend, but the weekend before, where Father John used the image of, like, he logged onto Netflix, and, like, he's got all these different genres of movies, you know, and they're all styled for him. Like, hey, we saw you watch this. You might like that, too. Why? Because it's in the same genre. You like war movies. Cool, here's another war movie. You like cartoons. Here's another cartoon. You liked, you know, rom-coms. Here's a rom-com. I mean, so Scripture's full of those genres. Our challenge is, for many of us, we don't know the Bible, that's why we're doing this. And because we don't know the Bible, I know enough. I mean, like, you go to the movie or you, you log on to Netflix and it has, you know, parentheses, drama. You know, or Friday the 13th, parentheses, horror. Thanks, like, I needed to know that. You know, but, so, but there's nothing like that in the Bible. It doesn't say song of songs, love poem. That's what it is. Or Job, wisdom literature. You, we don't get that. So we have to go, what is Job all about? Oh it's, oh, it's wisdom literature. Is there a book I can get that help me understand that? So that's why we recommended Peter Crave's book, You, you Can Understand the Bible, because it's helpful for things like that. There's lots of other books that are out there, too. Scott Hahn's got some good ones. There's so many resources, and online's got lots of them. But again and again, we want to keep saying, God is revealing truth through Genesis, it doesn't mean it's always literally true. And here's where our heads explode and we get nervous because then our question goes, so this isn't true, what else isn't true? So you mean the resurrection isn't true? That was just a metaphor, right? Like he really didn't rise from the dead. Uh, no, that would be literally true. So we, we, don't know how to, we don't know how to navigate. This is why fundamentalism is so appealing. Fundamentalism, black, white. Tell me what I can't do. Tell me what I must do. As much as we might think we don't like that, we actually do like that. When someone says, well, you actually have to think. Oh, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> well, that's why God gave you a mind. Oh, I thought it was just to memorize things. No, I'm actually supposed to engage my intellect. Okay? So... Um, so again, what was the snake prior to coming into the garden? We're going to get to that. That's, next, that's this coming weekend. Um, all right. What are some additional resources regarding the story of creation? Um, I, I'll try to think of some other ones, but I think personally one of the most fascinating books to read in the Old Testament um, is a book by a guy named Leon Cass called The Beginnings of Wisdom. It's, he's a, Cass is a devout Jew. And um, so he, he, he writes this kind of philosophical commentary on the book of Genesis from a Jewish perspective. It is, I think, extraordinary. Um, it's very different because we're, he's obviously not seeing everything as preparing for Jesus. But it's a helpful compliment to kind of get a Jewish mind on Genesis. One of the things, for example, that I find intriguing is like, so why did the serpent come to the woman? So he asks that question. As we're going to see this week, the man's right there, right? Like, she eats, turns, here, wants him? Like, this is a sin of omission. He should have been going, no! Run away! Don't listen to him, right? But he doesn't. He's just like, oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> like, play the man, moron. So, but Cass has this, I think, this really awesome um, little thought. He just says, um, so why did... Why does the serpent go to the woman? And his answer is, because the man has already seen the serpent, and he's rejected him. How? Because the man has named all the animals. Right? Don't think literal. Think, think deeper than that. Think, think philosophical and poetic right now. So God brings, God says, not good that you're alone. Boom, I'm going to bring you a snake. Uh, no. What does the serpent represent? Pure reason. 
And Cass's point is, man wants more than that. I want more than just my intellect to be stimulated. I want more than answers. I want relationship. I want love. So the serpent's rejected. So Cass has, if you're looking for a, maybe a provocative read, it's not a Catholic read, it's not a Christian read, um, but I find it to be a, um, a fascinating and helpful read to complement some of the things. Um, I'd still go back to Crave's book. And what was the other one that we put um, by, oh, by Kenneth Baker. That's another really good book too. So Peter Crave's You Can Understand the Bible and, Insi that, and Inside the Bible by Kenneth Baker. Both of those are on our website on the link for rerouting. You can take a look at those. Was the fall a singular event that happened at a particular point in time or a series of events, a gradual rebellion that happened over time? There's a link to the papal encyclical Humanae Generis. I don't know, 1950, I don't remember when it is. Um, but it's on our website. Um, encourage you to read that. Um, that's where the church um, teaches in a definitive way that it is, it is a real fall, a real rebellion by real first parents. And that somehow we are all, we all sin somehow in Adam. It's not a real personal sin, but the wound of sin is passed on to us. The this, this simplistic way maybe to understand this is um, think of a crack baby. So original sin is something like the child, the crack baby. Like, I didn't do anything. My parents did something, right? Or my mom did something, whatever. But the result of her sin, or her addiction in this case, right? It's hurt me. It's wounded me. So I'm, I'm born with a struggle now. In a similar kind of way, um, this is an analogy, so it's always going to break down, so don't push it too far. But in a similar kind of way, what, what is happened in Adam and Eve has been handed on to us. By the way, this is what makes possible this to redeem us. So we're going to look at this in week eight. As by one man's disobedience, Adam's, all fell. If sin entered the world, so through one man's obedience, all are potentially, right, saved. So one makes possible for the other. So it, there is a real fall. That part is true. The poetic way that it's described is up for grabs. Same thing, was, with, was there a tree? Why was the tree there in the garden? Remember, this is poetry for, make, for finding a way to speak to the necessary conditions of the relationship to continue. For friendship to be friendship, there must be trust. No trust, no friendship. God is constantly imploring us to trust. The enemy, as we're going to get more, much more into this week, is always trying to get us to doubt it. Um, I'm going to answer most of these rest of ones online. I want to take one more because this question comes up in one way or another a lot. So the question has something to do with, if I understand it correctly, um, if, I, if I misunderstand what's being um, spoken about in Genesis 3 in the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, it sound, I could potentially misunderstand it to mean that I shouldn't, um, I shouldn't dare to engage the intellect and pursue further learning. I should just be content with what God has revealed. So there's no place for science. So some people think there's this constant kind of antipathy between faith and reason, or between the church and science. That's a really common misunderstanding right now. The church is always, the church is the enemy of science. Where'd you hear that? I don't know, my high school teacher told it to me. Where'd they get it? Oh, they learned it in college. Oh, what's the proof of that? I don't know, but it must be true. It's all over the internet. Oh, interesting. <laughs> like, who founded the university? Catholic Church. Who are, like, you can go home and Google, like, you know, famous Catholic astronomers. Copernicus is a priest. Stars are named by Jesuit priests who lead the field in astronomy. Once you understand that a good God has created the universe, and you understand that he's given me 
reason, that's one of the things of being created in the image and likeness of God, and the, one of the purposes of reason is to understand the order of things, and in coming to understand the order of things, I will get a deeper, more profound awareness of who the good God is, then you go, let the mind run. So the church, the way we would put it, would be faith and reason are both after the same thing. They're after truth. Okay? So if you want to go deeper in that, Pope John Paul's encyclical letter, which is entitled Faith and Reason, would be really worth reading. Um, sci here, here's maybe one of the key things to say. Science can answer the question, can I? It can't answer the question, ought I? Or should I? I can take the heart out of my dying grandmother and put it in somebody who's much younger, thereby killing my grandmother. I can do that. Should I? Science can't answer that question. Now I need philosophy to get involved, which is going to be informed by a worldview. And the worldview is going to shape how I'm going to answer that question. Does this make sense? So science needs, needs guardrails. Just look at the last 120 years. If you know anything about Nazi Germany, what's moving the eugenics movement in Nazi Ger Germany, in large part, is blind science. We can do anything. Look at the experimentation that was done. Because it has, all the guardrails were off. Why? Because we said these human beings, they're not even human beings, they're subhuman beings. And because they're subhuman beings, we can do with them whatever we want to do with them. That was science informed with a faulty understanding of humanity. It had a flawed philosophy. Get, does that make sense for people? So we're, we're passionate about pursuing truth because we're passionate about understanding more the order of things because God has revealed he's the creator of things. And so we, I want, those, who, those who love want to know more. And to explore the universe is to know more about God, to see the beauty of constellations and Galaxies is to be more and more in awe of the God who said, you know, let there be light. To go deeper into the intricacies of how the human body is made is to be in awe of the one who made this. So by all means, we want to engage the intellect. We just want to make sure that we have um, a genuinely human understanding or a healthy understanding of what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman. And science can't do that. Science needs to be informed with something else. That's why John Paul says later in the letter we were looking at in The Lord and the Giver of Life, um, when the creator is eclipsed, then the creature made in his own image and likeness disappears. Now he's just an animal. I'm, you're no longer made in the image and likeness of God. I can do whatever I want to do with you. That's what happens when God, when God dies, when the death of God happens. And we've seen that, right? All the totalitarian regimes in the last 100 plus years have just made that, um, unfortunately, abundantly known. Okay? I'm going to take the rest of these and um, we'll try to answer them online. Um, I pray that... Um, I pray two things, that we're beginning to continue to get it. I also just want to keep encouraging us. Uh, a lot of our questions are really good questions, and we want to answer, we, we want to go into them because we want to know. At the same time, especially for those of us who don't know the story yet, try to stay like, honed in on the points. And try to take this to prayer and just keep praying, especially in front of the Blessed Sacrament with Genesis 2 and 3, especially this week with Genesis 3, and say, Lord, what are you trying to reveal to me? Okay? Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. 
Lord, again, we thank you for the gift of your word and for the splendor of having created us, for the love that you have for us, for the reality that you're our father and we are your children. Continue to help us to trust you, to know you, to listen for your voice and to be obedient to it. Mindful that you are the God who created us for life and life in abundance. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thanks, everybody.